Hey everybody, John Grimsmo here, and in this video, we're trying to figure out why our Norseman blades are not all absolutely identically the same. And we're trying to figure out why. It's driving me crazy. They're made on the Kern now, so they should be perfect. The fact that they're not perfect means that there is some variation somewhere that is driving me crazy. Um, yeah, because every one blade out of a bunch, out of a handful, will have a problem and we got to figure out why. So in this video, we're going to figure out why. I still don't know why. I have some theories. We'll dig into it. I've got a field trip planned for tomorrow. We're going to go up to Milterra to see my buddy Mike. He's got a big, beautiful shop. They have a CMM machine, a coordinate measuring machine that can tell us I can give him a bunch of blades and he can probe them all and he can tell me what's different between them. So that's what we're doing tomorrow. Okay, real quick, I'll show you. This is the tombstone that I came up with to make the Norseman blade. You can see I've got here one of our water jet blades. So at this stage, it's been water jet cut from a big sheet of stainless steel and then surface ground on our Okamoto surface grinder, which is in the back corner there. And then it goes on the fixture one-handed is awkward, like so. One screw holds it down on this side, and the top clamp holds it down on this side. We do dimple the back side of the top clamp, so the top clamp actually digs into the blade and leaves little dents in it, but... Because we only have one pivot point here and only a little bit of traction on the bottom of the clamp, theoretically, the blade can move this way, depending on friction and tightness and etc. Um, and we're at the point now where I'm trying to fine tune the most minute differences, the tiniest little moves because I want absolute repeatability, consistency between our knives. And we're almost there, but we're not exactly there yet. It's driving me crazy. So yeah, one theory is that maybe they're moving this way just a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to install a new shirt from my buddy Sam, HEA Designs. Um, I'm gonna install these little gripper pads. Just get these from McMaster. Just search for gripper pad. There's all kinds of different designs. I'm not actually gonna use this one. I'm gonna use a uh, through hole one. This one's threaded in the middle, but I'm gonna use one that you can put a cap screw in the top of it and screw it down. So basically I wanna put one there and one there and one there and one there, and that's gonna create these little tiny dents as I do for the lock inserts. And that's gonna create these little tiny dents like I do for these lock insert plates. Uh, it's not going to be a problem for later processes, but it will keep it still. That's what we need. So I think that's one of my solutions, but I want to go to Mike's tomorrow and he can tell me exactly what's wrong. Because in Canada here, we are at the tail end, hopefully, of COVID. There's still a lot of lockdowns going on, still required masks in most places. Um, so at Mike's, I am going to have to wear a mask and I don't know how I'm going to film well and uh, convey my thoughts properly. So we'll figure it out. Maybe I'll film and then dub over later. Um, we'll, we'll figure something out. But uh, yeah, we'll make it good. All right, so I have a pile of goodies going here. We have a Norseman with a good blade. We have some blades that slip, maybe. Another blade that has lock slip. Another blade. Um, these ones are having weird little detent issues. Soft detent soft detent. Most of the blades we make are fine. These are some outliers that we don't know why they're different. So they're going to measure the good blade, they're going to measure the soft detent, and they're going to measure the slip blades and tell us what's different. So I'm talking little tiny variations in the lock face, the 3D geometry of it, the tilt of it this way, the tilt of it this way, um, positioning of the blade hole, positioning of the arc front to back, positioning of the detent, hole, and specifically how they all relate to each other. A lot of that is too much for us to measure here, so a CMM machine will be perfect for that. Okay, we're back here at Milterra. 
I was last here a year and a half ago when Fraser and I filmed the whole shop tour and Mike gave us a wonderful tour of the whole place. Uh, he says it's much different now, but um, I'm excited to be here. I haven't been to a shop since then, since a year and a half because of COVID and everything. Um, so I'm super pumped to be back. And Mike here yes. is uh, you know, our gracious host for today. Thank you. So Thanks for coming. you've got insane inspection equipment, measuring equipment, uh, all this super micron accuracy fun stuff that I'm, I'm really interested to learn more about. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what we're going to do today? Yeah, so my understanding is you've got some blades that you brought with you and you sent over the CAD for those yesterday. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a look at how those blades compare to the CAD file that was sent. So we'll do a CAD compare on okay. our CMMs and look at you know a couple of the features of those blades and yep. see how they compare to what you sent. So, I don't know. We'll have to see exactly yeah, we'll what see. you want to do. <laughs> like like but, I, uh, I said earlier, there's something different about some of the blades and hopefully we can find out what's different. Right. And then how to avoid it in the future. Here we are in the CMM inspection room. We've got a big CMM here. And this Zeiss has already got our parts lined up. So it's just double-sided sticky tape to the vise. Um, but then the, the stylus comes in and measures a flat plane and it measures all the features and we've got it on the on the screen so it knows exactly where to go and what to do. So each blade's got a serial number on it and he's making a program with results for each serial number. locate those features you know he's, he's in the pivot point at the moment saying okay this is our zero point this is the you know the datum for this part there was a rotational datum and a planar datum with the, with the top of the blade and once that's complete then you know the CMM knows okay this part is located here and then it does an automatic alignment to precisely locate that part so now that's what's running at the moment. It's automatically locating that part. So it's surface scanning right now, collecting you know, thousands of points as it scans across the surface. Obviously, if we were measuring this in production, you'd have a, a fixture that would locate that part, so you wouldn't have to do a manual alignment. So you would just put the part into the fixture, and then the machine will locate it from there. But because we're just manually sticking it on, you know, randomly on double-sided tape, it doesn't know doesn't know where that part is until you do that manual alignment. Can you explain the head and how it's constantly sensing? Uh... Yeah. So the Zeiss fast heads are uh, sort of a continuous force sensor. It's essentially a three-axis uh, machine inside this head, so the sensor can can. Uh, react to contact, it knows where the contact vector is, and it can dynamically adjust uh, the amount of pressure that's put on the stylus. So what's the diameter of that stylus? So that's a one millimeter diameter stylus. Um, we can go down to 0.3 millimeters in diameter, right? 0.3? So even with such a small stylus, 0.3 millimeters in diameter, it's not going to break that stylus because it knows not to apply more than you know whatever force is, is, is necessary. Um, and even now, like as it comes around this corner, for example, um, you know if there's any variations in that geometry, it knows to adjust. Um, it can pull you know away from the surface, lowering the pressure, or if the surface moves away from where it expects it to be, it can 
move towards the surface to maintain that contact. So a traditional touch probe on a CNC machine is just on off. So it goes touch, touch, exactly. touch. Exactly. Yep. And on many CMMs too? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, many CMMs are built like that, but it's simply a trigger. So it triggers in, you know, in, in, in the head holds the stylus and it triggers in one direction or another direction. Right. If you're triggering off axis, then it needs to do a calculation to figure out, okay, this much of this trigger and this much of this trigger were activated. Here's our contact point. Whereas this is continually... Continuously, yeah, it's, it, it's almost, you can envision it's almost like rubbing the surface or test, like touching it and yep. feeling for what it's doing as it goes around. That's instead awesome. of just, you know, a dumb trigger. Yeah, yeah. So this is what then enables us to have an insane level of accuracy. Um, this specific machine uh, was actually just calibrated uh, using the... Uh, the highest accuracy uh, protocol for Zeiss machines, which is the Xenos machine that you've probably uh, heard of. So this is calibrated to 0.3 microns. So, Jeez. yeah, 0.3 microns, um, under 0.3 microns in, in accuracy. And then repeat the same process again. Yeah. And then what? And then we well, compare then we the analyze, data? Exactly. Then we can analyze all that data. We can look at the results for each one of those waves. We'll be able to look at form, uh, dimensions, uh, all this sort of thing, right? Position, rather, the position of each of those features. Yeah, because relative position of the endpoints of the arc, of the endpoint of the detent arc. Exactly. And the hole and the lock face, everything, yep. everything matters. Ooh. Huh. Wow, yeah. Holy cow. Okay. So what are we looking at? So your good part, this is the latch profile here. It's very green, looks good. The two bad ones, you can see here, it's out. Oh. And it's almost the same on both. Interesting. And then same. 63 microns. This groove here is good. On the bad ones, it's shifted over. And it's thinner here, thicker here. Same on both. It's shifted in position and it's thinner on one side. Just low on material here and then high on material here. So the whole thing is happening right here. It's basically this corner is out of position. Right? So the corner is supposed to be here. Like well, this is probed in two separate operations, right? No, it's just hands on the line. Yeah. Right? So it's oh, saying okay. that's what it is. This is right. This is your part. Yeah. This is scanning this way. This yeah. is scanning around the whole blade, right? So it comes down and says, yeah. Like I expect material a flat surface, right, all the way to here. Yeah. And yeah. It's blah 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 blah, and then it dips down a little bit, so the corner's a bit rounded, and then it's a bit high, and then good. This is actually really good. All right, so we're back at the shop. We got all the results. Uh, I wanna sit down here in our break room with Angelo and with Eric, and we'll go over all the results, compare them to the blades, and get their thoughts on it. So each blade has like five sheets. Yep. So maybe separate them out. Yeah. And they did the same for each one? Yeah, they numbered each one. So that goes to this one. This is yeah. the profile of three lines to make up a surface on the lock, I see. Yeah, so this is the 3D surface. Okay. All so of these are kind of perspective view, like a little crooked. Yeah. But imagine these are vertical lines going this way. Mm -hmm. And if it was perfect, these would be thin. They'd be no color. Mm -hmm. They'd be like super thin. But the fact that they're green is up here somewhere. Mm -hmm. So so this is in process. You're saying that it doesn't it like kick, like it you're having some issues machining in there. It's, it's never an issue. I've just always wondered because you've got a small anvil going into an almost same size corner. It's just driving right into the corner yeah. and then retracting. It's not like rolling around the corner. So I've always known it was like a maybe, 
thing and t to see it, you're like, holy cow. <clears throat> so do you need to go in with like an even smaller end? You though? could. Or I can drill and ream each endpoint. Which should theoretically be fine. Be good. Because yeah, we might have something here, but maybe it is growing and the, maybe like this is definitely going to change in heat treat. Yeah, you're right. So let's just to know, and it does this change in heat treat with this thin that section here, like this thin hmm. little wall. See, because on all of them, the other wall is pretty good. Yeah, and same for here. You're really good here. It's true. And, and then, then we get back, back here. Where the blade gets thinner and thinner and yeah. thinner, and then it goes there and there. Well, that was some really interesting information. Uh, I have a lot of things to try now on the Norseman blade, try to get them a little bit better, a little bit tighter. Um, one thing I'm working on right now is installing these gripper pads into the Norseman fixture. You can see I've gone in and I've bored holes for each one. I just threaded the bottom of them so I can screw them down and uh, I've got them installed here. So this way the blade will now have some actual purchase into the fixture and uh, hopefully not move at all. I don't know if it is moving, but this will at least eliminate that from my mind. Um, so I'm really excited to do that. And uh, if it works, probably do another video, update you guys later. But uh, yeah, I got a lot of things to test right now. This is only one of the things. And then other, just strategy, reaming these holes, how to ream better, how to do everything better. We're just, we're shooting for that last little 0.01% and uh, everything's got to be perfect. So it's a fun challenge. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.